إذا نبدأ الجلسة الثانية بعنوان التعلم التطبيقي حضورنا الكريم وفيها محاور مثل كيفية التغلب على صعوبات التعلم المؤسسي والبيانات الكبيرة في المؤسسات المتعلمة وتوجهات واعدة أيضا وتسخير التكنولوجيا لبناء ودعم التعلم التنظيمي مع السيد إليوت ماسي الرئيس التنفيذي والمؤسس لمعهد ماسي والبروفيسورة ماري كارسن أستاذة التعلم المؤسسي كلية آيفي لإدارة الأعمال والبروفيسورة ماريون ماثيو عميد كلية التربية في الهند وسيدير الجلسة البروفيسور سيدوان فرنانديس من جامعة ميدل سيكس أستاذ اقتصاد في جامعة ميدل سيكس Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. It's going to be a very, very interesting and uh, academically sound se session. We have three professors with, uh, with us to give their views on uh, organizational learning. I'll just send the, uh, set the uh, house rules for the session. Each speaker will speak for 20 minutes. And uh, at the end of the session, uh, we will uh, take questions from the audience. Okay, so without further ado, I'll call our first speaker, Elliot Massey of the Learning Consortium uh, to give his talk. Elliot. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it is a honor to be here. I was asked and each of us were asked to take just a minute or two to introduce ourselves. And then I would like to uh, take you through a little bit of a tour of what we consider to be a key issue. Uh, my name is Elliot Maisie. I am the chair of the Learning Consortium. Uh, we are an unusual organization in that we work with uh, primarily very large corporations. Uh, we have 230 members. They include some names that would be familiar to you, the Walt Disney Corporation, Google, Microsoft. We are proud that Emirates Airlines has been a member of the consortium for many years. Uh, and we also work with Yahoo and the United States Department of State and, and the like. And our goal is to ask a very key critical question, which is what type of learning can organizations do to help their new employees and their existing employees be better at their jobs? Uh, so we study, we experiment, um, we do research around this key issue. Uh, the two other things that I do is I am on the board of faculty for a, a doctoral program taught in the world of learning at Wharton in Pennsylvania. And it's a mid-career program doing some great research. And finally, uh, I serve as an advisor to uh, the United States government, the Department of Defense, and others on issues related to learning. I had shared with a colleague here with the military uh, from Emirates that we've done some, some work together. Um, I have a number of, of pictures, and I'm, I'm not going to do traditional PowerPoint, and in a moment I will explain a little bit about why not. But, but I'd like to use some pictures to take us through a, a conversation about um, the world of learning. Um, one of the areas that I'm spending a lot of time on is something that you probably read about called big data, and just finished a book with the American Society for Training and Development looking at the world of, of big data. I'm going to focus as much not only on the big side of big data, but the my side of, of big data. In other words, how does an individual use information and use data to help them learn, to help them get their job or, or get promoted or, or the like? And we're going to explore data and learning personalization in these 20 minutes. 
I want to start, though, with this picture. And um, I think it's really important for us in the world of learning to make a distinction between teaching and learning. Teaching and learning, or training and learning. I travel all around the world. I was, uh, had the honor of being right here in the Emirates in, uh, and in Abu Dhabi back in 1998. Meet, met with uh, Sheikh Zayed and the Chamber of Commerce. And I was so excited that in this country there was a commitment to not only teaching, but what learning would be. Um, we recently, about six months ago, visited the Cleveland Clinic building an enormous new hospital here in Abu Dhabi. And the conversation there was about learning. How do you create a hospital where the culture is learning? But I think the biggest mistake that governments, institutions, even colleges sometimes make, is that we are more focused on the delivery than we are on the reception, meaning I can give a speech, but nobody can listen. I can give a class, and people can nod their head, but they might not learn. I am more and more convinced that if we look at this picture, this child is engaged in that moment of learning that's most important, which is curiosity. When I'm curious about something, I will learn it. When I am intrigued with something, I will learn it. And in many situations, I believe we have lost our focus on looking at what makes curiosity a more powerful part of learning. Now, technology is one of the areas that we spend a lot of time on. We have a laboratory in, um, in New York State where we do research on um, what technology might do to the world of learning. And I am a geek. I am the, uh, the, the guy who loves to buy and experiment with technology. So I will be one of the first people with the Apple Watch around January 15th. Um, and I'm intrigued for a moment. And I, I'm going to ask you to, to consider this for a moment. What if we had the way away, and the, certainly the digital wa wearable watches will be part of this, what if we had a way of gaining more and more data about our own selves and our own actions. Now, when the Apple Watch comes out in a couple of weeks, the first major set of things that Apple will look at is health. They are very interested, for instance, if somebody has diabetes, could they use the watch to help somebody learn about their own eating patterns with diabetes? And there'll be many of those things. But I'm also intrigued with learning. Um, it'd be very interesting to say to somebody, well, do you collaborate well in your job? Oh, yes, I collaborate quite a bit. Well, do you have any data about who you collaborate with? And you might find that they go to lunch with the same four people, that they talk to the same three people all the time, that they return emails from the same nine people, but what if we started to get a bit more data about ourselves? Um, at Google, which is different than Apple in, from the watch point of view, uh, Google has a program that they're experimenting with now to give you suggestions of people you might eat lunch with this week. Based on your curiosity, on your learning programs, on your need to mentor in that part. And in fact, they're very generous. They will give you wonderful free food. But the more important issue is, will you actually then maybe collaborate with somebody who's different? And for any of you who have worked with a coach or who have mentored somebody, you will often know that the individual's behavior is a bit different than the data will show them about themselves. So we are intrigued with that. Uh, I recently, uh, a few weeks ago, had a wonderful opportunity to interview and keynote with Sir Ken Robinson. And many of you have probably read or heard about Sir Ken. Uh, Sir Ken is the most widely watched TED video in the world. There now are 24 million people that have watched his video on learning personalization. 
And I asked Sir Ken an interesting question, which is, what are we heading towards for learning personalization? What does learning personalization mean? And we came up with, in that conversation, three levels of, of personal. Number one, I, the learner, ideally, want to learn what I don't know already that I really need to know now. <laughs> what I don't know already, what I really need to know now. Now, many of you have gone to courses, even a management course, and somebody is giving you a theory of management and you're sitting there nodding your head like this and in fact you've heard 80% of it before. And your curiosity starts to drop. But what if you could go to a course where they knew exactly what I don't know and now the more interesting thing, what I need to know now and I could learn and focus on that. The second piece is can I learn in a way that maps or is best for me? And you heard earlier, and our speaker was right on target, talking about reading, for instance, the, the role of reading. Now, many people aren't natively or naturally readers, but we want at some level to map to how do I ideally learn? For some people it's reading, for some people it's video, for some people it's a conversation, for some people it's a laboratory experience. And then lastly, and this is a really interesting element of personalization, can I fail my way to success? Can I fail my way to success? Can I practice? Can I practice that new skill? And if need be, I might fail in, in that process. But that we know if I'm learning athletics or other things, how important practice is. Now, e-learning is one of those areas where we're spending a lot of time looking at this issue of big data. And I either get praised or criticized for having helped popularize the term in the United States of e-learning back in the mid-1990s. But I, I want to ask you for a moment to uh, consider, and even for a moment, to turn to your neighbor. What does the E in e-learning stand for? So you think about the E of e-learning. What does the E stand for? Now, the natural thing would be to say electronic. But what else does that E stand for? So just for a moment, just turn to whoever you're sitting next to. What, what would the E stand for? Take about 10 seconds to, to ask that question. Excellence. So let's ask, what would the E stand for? What might be some words? You can shout them out here. Yes, yeah, sir. Empowerment. Empowerment. What else? Effective. Effective. Another one. Enhancing knowledge. Enhancing knowledge. And I think one of the interesting things when we look at e-learning is to go from the technology of e-learning, which has been interesting and exciting, but I must say in some cases, incredibly boring. <laughs> incredibly boring. I made a funny joke at, the, at a meeting at the White House in which I argued that e-learning should be regulated like a drug. <laughs> because if you're having trouble sleeping, in some cases, take a nice e-learning course and you will sleep better at the end of that. Um, one of the people who we got involved in this conversation is Secretary Hillary Clinton, who was, um, as you know, was uh, uh, from the State Department. And I had her as a speaker, and this was her quote. I asked her to talk about e-learning. So last year, this was uh, Secretary Clinton's quote. He goes, the E, as I know, Elliot Maisie constantly reminds us, the E in e-learning is more than electronics. It's about learning for everyone, everywhere, to be effective, to evolve, to be engaging. And whether you are a company or a country, it means you have to constantly seek out and gather the information that will help you take on complex challenges. Now, what I'm trying to argue and what we, we see is that e-learning is just the technology. 
But how do we make it effective, engaging, involving, and the like? And that's in part where personalization happens. And I think it's exciting, whether you heard it from a former leader of Malaysia, or whether when I heard it from Sheikh Zayed, or I hear it from somebody like Secretary Clinton, that the leaders of our country understand the role that learning must play in our own economic development, in job development, and more. Now, some of what's changing is our lives are changing. This is a picture, not of my house, but it would have been my house. I grew up in New York City. This was the way we used to watch television. Literally, on Sunday evening, we would sit and we would watch TV. And we all gathered to watch the same show. In the United States, we had a variety show called The Ed Sullivan Show. I met the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. I saw the first music. But it has changed. Back then, when we did learning, it was everybody does it at the same time learning. But now, this is what TV looks like to most people. How many people even watch television live anymore? We watch it stored. We watch it on our DVR and the like. Uh, I sometimes get in trouble. My wife and colleague is here. I sometimes want to watch a mystery, a movie, but I only want to watch the ending for the last 10 minutes of that. I want to drive. I want to personalize my own learning. We believe that this concept of learning personalization is going to be a very powerful one that is the reality for people at home and when they come to work, they're going to ask that same question. I told a story here literally many years ago about we hired somebody to work at the Maisie Center and I was very excited as the CEO to give her a two-hour orientation about her job. And she looked at me and she said, is it mandatory? I said, what? She goes, you're the e-learning guy. Don't you have something short I could watch? I said, why would you want to watch the short video rather than spend two hours with me? She goes, you're a lot like my father. Your stories will probably go on a very long time. Now, I didn't know whether to be angry at her or to become a learner. I decided to become a learner, and what I came to understand is the best role we can play as learning professionals, whether we're at the corporate or at the college level, at the work level, is that we can always be focusing in on this concept of personalization. It doesn't mean that each person does what they want. In fact, I would argue we, will, we should add more testing, more competency-based, and the like, but that we should spend our time learning what I don't know that I need to know in the style that I like in a collaborative and engaging format. Facebook, uh, one of the groups that I do a lot of work with, has changed their model for learning. Their old model was at Facebook, one size fits all. Now their model for learning at Facebook is one size fits one. Their goal at Facebook is that the learning that Joan or Bob or Mohammed or Sarah does on any one day will be different based on what they need to know what their style is, what their job is, and, and the like. So they are deconstructing a lot of classrooms, they are deconstructing a lot of lectures, and are instead moving to a very personalized and scalable model of learning. Their goal is not to do less learning. Their goal is to do more because they want it to map to the curiosity of the learner. Now we need to get I believe we need to get some wonderful information about our own learning decisions. We need to get more evidence about our learning decisions. One of the areas that will be most interesting for us is how do we curate content or how do we get content rated and ranked by other individuals? 
So I had shared with a number of, of folks before, great, uh, some of the elements about how we change in the world of learning. And one of the ways in which we will change in the world of learning is that we will increasingly ask learners to help rate, rank, advise, adapt, and change content. We will increasingly ask for connected learning. I want to read a wonderful article, and then I want to argue about that article with nine other learners around the world. My model of the classroom and e-learning is a connected model. We want to add a gamification, gaming, or simulation, or opportunity to fail our way to success, if need be. We have to accept on some level that learning will, in fact, be occurring everywhere. If you ask a physician how do they want to learn, they never mention the classroom. They want to be able to learn from their phone, from their tablet, before or after an operation with colleagues that they trust around the world. Big learning data will in many ways give us the opportunity to look and, and, and analyze data that we goes into learning. Now, one of the areas is PowerPoint, and I, like you and others, use PowerPoint. But I think we need some research, and we don't have a lot of research. We do not know at the end of a class how much people retain from using the PowerPoint model as an image. One of the elements that we want to do as well is to ask the question, how much of learning content will come from the open world? We've noticed a radical shift in the United States in the last 12 months. Corporations have radically increased by 42% the use of TED videos and open content rather than buying it from third party suppliers in that light. And what will be that role of open? And finally, I think we're gonna take a look at what the role of video is. Uh, and when I think of video, I don't necessarily think of video as Hollywood video. Uh, I always like to tell learning leaders, when you think of video, use my hands and go like this. Good enough. Good enough. The person at the end doesn't want the video to be slick. They want it to be now. They want it to be current. They want it to be relevant. Learners will also become makers, explore things like 3D printing, the ability for a learner to see how something is created and to be part of that process. The world of MOOCs and other speakers will talk about them are powerful. I don't believe that we're done. I think we're in the first day of a MOOC. But here's an interesting one. If you are Emirates Airlines or you are Etihad Airline, how do you train every single employee on what to do about Ebola? You can't take them back to the class, and it's not a simple e-learning process. So I think we have some elements. When I wrap up, um, one of the things we do in addition to learning is my wife and I own racehorses. Uh, we had a wonderful opportunity to go to some racehorses in, um, in Dubai. But this racehorse, I have Miss Matzo Ball, just won her largest race ever. It's wonderful. We're so excited for her. And she'll be a three-year-old. And this is her younger sister, Kinky Socks. But we don't know, will Kinky Socks race the same way Miss Matzo Ball raced? We don't know. Our, our, our worst assumption would be they're sisters, so they'll be exactly the same. But if I think about the world of learning and I think about the world of big learning data, they probably are not. We need to get data about how individuals, how organizations, and how processes learn. Um, in wrapping up, I would argue one enormous uh, truth. Learning is natural. Learning is a process given to us by our God. It is a natural process. Most kids learn how to read without a PowerPoint. Most kids do some other levels of development. They learn how to walk without necessarily going to a class. What we have to do is get at the natural process of learning, and I think that big data and small data will help us in that process. It is a great honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I look forward to our conversations and dialogues. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Elliot. I'm sure you've raised a lot many questions. So audience, please take notes and we'll have a panel discussion at the end. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Mary Croissant. Uh, I've asked the speakers just to give a brief uh, uh, background about themselves. Uh, in the interest of time, I don't want to go through the whole biodata. Uh, Professor Mary. Uh, good morning. It's uh, my uh, pleasure to be here with you. I'm Mary Crossan. I'm a professor of strategic leadership at the Ivy Business School, in, uh, located in London, Canada. That's about two hours west of Toronto. Uh, have any of you uh, been to Canada? In 20 minutes, I'm going to try to give you about 30 years of research and work that I've done with organizations, uh, multinational companies in the area of organizational learning. My focus has largely been on uh, uh, or organization level learning as opposed to individual level learning. So let me uh, uh, go from that kind of perspective. Uh, the swimming with crocodiles, I was very intrigued by this theme. You think about the word learning and it sounds so safe and uh, it's nothing but safe for many individuals and organizations. And you'll see from the research that I've done and the work in this area, perhaps why it's been so challenging for organizations. Let, let's take a look at what we do know. We know that organizational learning is the foundation for excellence. We know it's more than knowledge management, which tends to be a major problem for many companies who seem to want to uh, take knowledge management processes as a way of organizational learning. But yet those kinds of processes can actually undermine uh, what uh, learning can bring, and I think Elliot's comments give you some indication about why that may be the case. Uh, organizations are not fully embracing the possibilities. There's enormous uh, possibility for organizational learning, yet we haven't quite got there yet. And that leadership of organizational learning is both critical and underdeveloped. One of the pieces I'd like to share with you is that we've, under, in fact, underestimated the need for leader character. So it's a new piece that we bring to the table on this as a foundation for organizational learning. So this is a model I've worked with over many, many years. Uh, my, my training is actually in the area of strategic leadership. So I've always looked at strategic renewal of organizations and how organizations undergo uh, strategic renewal over time. And the, uh, essentially, the connection that we're looking at is how leadership impacts the organizational learning system and how that impacts strategic renewal and ultimately the performance of an organization. This could be any organization. It could be a government organization, a not-for-profit organization, a for-profit organization, small, large. Essentially, the, uh, the systems that we're looking at uh, apply to all of these. So this is a very busy slide, but if you ever want to read the article, it's in the Academy of Management Review 1999. This particular article that uh, I wrote with colleagues, um, Harry Lane and Rod White, won the Decade Award in 2009 as the most highly cited article in the Academy of Management Review from that year. Why that's uh, particularly important is that for an article on organizational learning to be the most highly cited article in the Academy of Management tells you about the importance of this area. This particular model that was, um, we, we developed at that time indicates maybe why it is that organizational learning is so difficult. It's multi-level. It moves from individuals through to groups and into the organization. And if you take a look at the words on the right-hand side of that, think about at the individual level, intuiting, experiences and images and metaphors. Well, that is really complicated stuff even at the individual level. We have to take from the individual level then that learning and be able to uh, transform that into group level learning, into getting shared understanding, interactive systems, and then embedding this in the organization in terms of systems and routines, strategy, procedures, new product, new innovation. How is it that we go from these individual insights, the intuitive process, through to the institutionalizing process in organizations? 
Now, the interesting piece about this particular model as we moved over time, it was not simply going from the individual to the organization, but the fact that organizations then, those systems and structures, impact how individuals see the world and how groups interact. So I'm going to give you a bit of a challenge here, a mental challenge as I move to the next slide, is that picture this uh, slide here now moving into a two by two. So this is going to be challenging. Essentially, what you're looking at is from the individual group and organization arrayed against each other, we can now understand and begin to think about the feed-forward learning from individuals and groups to the organization while we simultaneously have systems and structures that are embedded at the organization level that are impacting groups and, and individuals. As an example, we know that the structures of organizations impact who talks to who. In, in organizations. You change the structure, you, you change the patterns of communication. We know things like compensation and reward systems impact what individuals pay attention to. And so we've got this feedback flow of learning from the organization uh, to the individuals. Now what we find typically in most organizations, entrepreneurial, is that they have a lot of feed-forward learning, but they don't embed a lot in the organization. And then what their challenges are is being able to replicate that learning. In mature organizations, we get a lot of feedback learning. We often think of it as bureaucracy in companies that impedes the capacity for the, the uh, feed-forward flow of learning. So in many ways, the exploitation can fight the exploration of learning in an organization. So I'm going to give you another mental challenge. Uh, I developed a uh, diagnostic that we've used in organizations. If you picture, there's, there's five different colors there, the human capital in the yellow, the group dynamics in the purple, strategic alignment in the orange, and then the feed forward and the feedback. In the next uh, diagram I'm going to show you is the uh, results of a, of a typical study in an organization about how organizations line up in their capacity for each of these five areas. This would be typical sample data from an organization. And this is on a one to seven point scale uh, where there had been survey results, seven being a high score on this. And what you see, this is a typical pattern in which the individual level learning bar exceeds the feed forward uh, bar of learning. Take a moment and consider what you think the implications of that might be. What happens in an organization where that yellow bar exceeds the feed forward bar by that kind of magnitude? Essentially, you've created a bottleneck for learning in the organization. And most organizations continue to feed the yellow bar. It gets higher and higher. What do you think happens to those individuals in the organization when the yellow bar continues to rise and the feed forward, the capacity to absorb that learning does not change in the organization? Well, in North America, we, we talk about it. You're training for the competition. Individuals leave the organization where they don't have the capacity for that organization to absorb the talent and the learning that they have. Uh, working with one multinational organization, sitting around the, uh, the leadership table, the, the uh, CEO and the senior executives, and they said, well, who's responsible for this anyways? Who do you think they, return, they look to? HR, human resources. They didn't see it really as the leadership responsibility of the senior people in the organization to ensure that the capacity that they already had in the organization of their individual learning was, exactly, was absorbed by the organization. That becomes a major problem. So if we take a look at this cascading flow, at the, at the core of it all is the personal leadership of very senior people in the organization how it is they impact the learning stocks and flows, and ultimately the performance of the organization, whatever that performance may be, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, economic and financial performance. So promising directions. We vastly underestimated in the 30 years, it's hard, it's hard for me to believe I never discovered this up until about five years ago, and here we're finding incredible leverage in this area of leader character as a foundation for organizational learning. 
And most of the work I do uh, of late is around the development of character and competency. And we talk about a piece I've just written around the character competency entanglement, the synergistic, multiplicative, and amplifying effect of highly developed leader character interwoven with highly developed leader competence, much like the uh, DNA strands uh, uh, double helix effect. The model of the effective leader that we're working with, one is to say, is that you need character, competence, and commitment. And this came out of the uh, 2008 economic crisis where we traveled the world asking leaders what had gone wrong, what were these failures of learning that had happened in organizations. And what we found uh, with the leaders that we spoke with, about 350 uh, in focus groups, they said it was the uh, lack of character. Unfortunately, they didn't know what character was, they didn't know how to define it, they all just sensed that it was important. <clears throat> We've done a lot of work in the last five years to try to understand that. And if you look at the bottom triangle, we think about that as a character, the virtues, the values, and traits that anchor the individual to understand and be able to cope with the situational pressures and the context that is incredibly challenging. The cycle in the middle is really the learning cycle, one of understanding and awareness, a judgment, intent, behavior, and reflection. And typically what we're finding happening is that the situational pressures or the context essentially outweighing the capacity of individuals to be able to deal with it. You may or may not know how strongly context affects character. There are many, many studies that get us into things like the bystander effect, social conformity, influence of power, and uh, more recently, a very interesting area of money priming, simply having, in the, this case, screensavers with currency on it impacts how individuals make decisions and their quality of judgment and decision making. One of our major banks in Canada in their capital markets group has asked me to come in to work on developing with their traders um, strength of character because the uh, CEO knows that the quality of judgment of, and decision making of his best traders are ones that have strength of character, that over time their character erodes uh, partially because of this issue of the money priming effect. So this is the model of character that we have developed over a long period of time. It's based, many of you may know, the work of Martin Seligman, the former president of the American Psychological Association. And uh, the interesting work that he had done was to establish what are the aspects of character that have stood the test of time, that they apply across religions and across culture. And uh, what we've done is taken his work and translated into the context of organizations and business. We've gone to leaders to say, what's the language of business that helps us understand it? Uh, typical of what Aristotle would have talked about in the middle of this is judgment, practical wisdom. We cannot uh, be able uh, to, to train people to deal with all situations that they may encounter. What we need from uh, individuals and organizations is the quality of judgment and decision making. But we need that anchored in very, uh, very important aspects of character. Dimensions, for example, we heard earlier of humility, humanity, integrity, temperance, justice, accountability, courage, transcendence, drive, collaboration. What we also know from these elements of character is that every one of these virtues becomes a vice in excess or deficiency. So humility in excess does not lead to the quality of judgment that we need. Neither does courage in its excess. It leads to recklessness. So when we think about these areas of, uh, of uh, dimensions of character, these are also ones that we've developed a, an assessment instrument around, and we've now worked with companies on 360 assessment around leader character to help them in terms of identifying areas where uh, in, leaders can, uh, can develop further. What we need to keep in mind is that virtues become vices in excess or deficiency, that these character dimensions are interconnected. So we may talk about integrity and we assume that everybody has integrity, 
But again, integrity not anchored in humanity or not anchored in courage becomes a dogmatic uh, a type of integrity. The character dimensions are non-negotiable. This is unlike other areas of personality traits in which we simply look at strengths and don't focus on the weaknesses necessarily. In the case of character, the weaknesses are the, the uh, aspects of character that lead to the deficiencies that become vices. Character is exercised through judgment. The quality of judgment impacts individual and hence organizational performance. Character is practice and can be developed, so contrary to popular be belief, this isn't something that you're simply born with. We develop character. We have many now leadership development programs where we look at those aspects of character and help people create the awareness for how it is that they can develop character. And importantly, context can build or erode character. So there's an unattributed quote, but it uh, brings us all back down to the, to the ground. Uh, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Gives us a sense of the importance of character and how character is really anchored in the very basics of how we perceive the world, how we relate to one another what we pay attention to. And these are the kinds of things that we want to focus on. So the next steps, organizational learning is dependent on people who have the disposition to lead themselves, others, the organization, and society. For us, when we talk about leadership, it is not leadership as position, but it is disposition to lead. It's that no matter where you sit in the organization, leadership requires us to be able to stretch ourselves, challenge others, and uh, uh, this becomes very important throughout the organization. We desperately, desperately need leaders who seek to develop character alongside competencies to enable organizational learning. <clears throat> Organizations need to elevate character alongside competencies in leadership development to enable organizational learning. And I'll pause on that last point because that is probably the piece that has given the most resonance to every organization that we've operated with. The competency perspective has dominated organizations, but without regard to the depth of the character of the individuals who have those competencies. And so for us, we want to develop a language and an approach in organizations that bring and elevate character alongside competencies. So I understand we'll take uh, questions later, and I'll just leave you with, this is the uh, view from my cottage in Canada. So if you wondered what uh, a fall looks like in Canada, that's, uh, that's the cottage, and I look forward to uh, uh, hearing your questions uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mary. Uh, I call, on, call upon now our next speaker, Professor Marion Matthew, to give her talk, please. A very good morning to one and to all. I'm Professor Marion Matthew. Uh, working basically in a century-year-old agriculture university, but I am working in the Department of School of Education as a head and dean. Uh, prior to this, I was associated with the Ministry of Human Resource Development as a member in the Na uh, National Monitoring Committee for Minorities Education with the Government of India. Also, I am uh, associated with the National Peer Team Assessor uh, who goes around as an inspection team, assessing different universities for their quality and awarding them A grade, B grade, or C grade. Our university, uh, Shiites University, Sam Higginbottom Institute of Agriculture, Technology, and Sciences, uh, is a university with 14,000 students. Uh, from all over the world, we have students uh, dealing in uh, engineering, agriculture, education, management, uh, etc. Uh, I'm very, very privileged 
to stand before you a second time attending this organization learning conference. Last year when I attended the organization learning conference at Dubai, I was amazed at the commitment, at the eagerness to learn of the UAE, at the Emirates. In fact, I was very inspired to take back home the determination of your country uh, to engage yourself in the field of learning, to enhance the quality, assess technology, all this. This I'm speaking from the personal experience. And today, I present before you regarding information technology, how technology affects our learning. And my topic for presentation today is Wellsprings of Knowledge, Harnessing Technology for Building and Sustaining Organizational Learning. My presentation will basically focus on the mediating factors of information technology, management challenges, learning objectives and developmental process of organization learning, and then how information technology basically affect organization the, through the case study of Deloitte and Walmart. The ability to create and strengthen revolutionary changes in an organization through the use of information technology requires a sustainable competitive commitment and openness to learning. And I was so delighted to listen to my previous speakers, Mary and Professor Massey. They really stressed on commitment and character. And I see for every organization, commitment is very essential, leadership and commitment. And this emotional commitment of the members of the organization basically springs from the leadership ability of the hierarchy. A leader, how he is able to motivate the team members depends on the team skills. And this emotional commitment of the team will speak of the output and the excellence of the organization. Perhaps the largest single influence on organizational architecture and design has been the evolution of information technology. Now we look at the mediating factors of information technology. Basically, the decisions of management affect a wide, widely in every aspect of the functioning of the entire organization. The culture of the organization if the culture is a people friendly, if the persons in the organizations are enabled to grow and give the best of their output, then that organization has a chance to become an excel, to become number one in the world. The structure of the organization speaks of the hierarchy, the decision making, division of labor, etc. The one another mediating factor of the information technology is a standard procedure. Then the environment. Environment has to do a lot. If there is a cordial atmosphere, an attitude of give and take, then the members of the organization will feel like giving their best. And that is what all about organization learning. They will be open to learning, they will be dedicated, they will be committed, they will put themselves out for the sake of the organization and learning takes place not at the individual level but at the group level as well. Now we look at the management challenges. Organizations and information systems, changing roles of systems in organization is a very important aspect. Whenever a change is initiated, in the organization, it is the absolute duty of the leader to make sure 
that every member in the organization is well informed and they, the new learning, new change is facilitated. Decision making and information systems, sustainability and competitive advantage, information systems and business strategy. Now we look at knowledge management and information technology. Professor Massey referred to how we manage the information. Now what is the essential is that we have the ability to filter through what is absolutely essential knowledge. And that is what in the academic setup that we are challenged with. How to train our students to filter through the right knowledge that would help them to develop their personality, to progress academically, and to become someone in the world and someone uh, very important to the organization. What is ideally required is an approach that links the individual and the organization with the learning processes, systems, and technology, which will benefit both in a reciprocal partnership. That partnership give and take attitude is very, very important. Now we look at how knowledge uh, guides us in analyzing data and utilizing information. And it has a process. We all know we obtain knowledge from information. And information we receive from various data which is available to us. And in the process of filtering those information that we get, we go through this process of comparison, consequences, connections, and conversations. How does information about one situation is compared to other situations we have known? What implications does the information have for decisions and actions? Connections, how does this bit of knowledge relate to others? Is the knowledge and the information is only vested with the authorities and the hierarchies? Or does it percolate down to the, uh, even to their co-workers? The colleagues and the co-workers, the support staff, is the vision of the organization shared with everyone. If we have to progress and make creativity as one of our targets to achieve organizational excellence, then information has to be percolated down to all the stakeholders. Now we have the uh, knowledge management cycle. It's self-explanatory how Learning takes place through the creation of knowledge, how we acquire knowledge and the knowledge that is acquired, how we integrate, utilize, disseminate, or categorize into various aspects as per the need of the organization, of the educational institutions, for the uh, professors, uh, for the colleagues, uh, to uh, share that information with the students, with the organization, with the parents, with the public, in the city in which way you are. Then performance management also involves planning, action, monitoring, and reviewing. Certain agreements on objectives and standards to be achieved, implementing plans to achieve for the day-to-day -day work, actions and outcomes are continually monitored by managers. Whichever way you take feedback from the organization, or from the uh, colleagues, from the members of the organization. But this monitoring is absolutely essential, whatever method that you use. Until and unless we assess ourselves, evaluate ourselves, we remain stagnant. For the progress, evaluation is compulsory. Now we come to the uh, organization learning very basically the five disciplines. The personal mastery, that the individuals are to be very well skilled, sound in knowledge, they should know what is expected of them, and then they should be motivated to give their best. 
shared vision of the organization, whether it is an academic institution, whether it is a business institution, the vision has to be shared by, shared with everyone. All should be familiar, familiar with what is expected of them. Then team learning, working as a team. Whatever individual information that you have, share it with the corporates. The corporate learning is an uh, essential part of the organization learning. Then the mental models, the nuances uh, that are brought into it, uh, the ability to initiate again and again more and more creative uh, approaches to learning, uh, that goes in for the mental models. Then systems thinking, uh, what is next that we can achieve? A kind of a vision for the entire organization. Uh, this we all of us are familiar with the shared features of all the organizations uh, called for the hierarchy, the clear division of labor, explicit rules and procedures, and then the impartial judgments of the uh, entire organization. We look at how information system affect organization. Cultural theory, information technology must fit organization's culture to be accepted. Every organization has a culture. They have their vision, they have their target, and then the information, the technology that is aiding the organization should fit into the culture of the institution. Then agency theory that speaks of firm is nexus of contracts among agents who make decisions. Certain uh, contract that you enter into, uh, certain knowledge exchangement, Manage, um, uh, management exchange, all these things speaks of the agency theory. Then behavioral theory, information system could change hierarchy of decision making, reduce need for middle management, clerical support, and distribute information. Uh, again, we look at how the information helps uh, uh, for the transaction cost theory. Organizations attempt to minimize transa transaction costs internally and externally. Uh, this economical management, the financial management of the uh, organization uh, is very important for the organizations to be uh, stable and sustaining. Then microeconomic model, information technology is a factor of production and labor. Then decision and control theory, this is very important. How the decision of uh, uh, every organization is affecting uh, the stakeholders, the individuals, people who are di directly involved in it, people who are indirectly involved in it. Then why organizations build information system? There are two factors, environmental factors and institutional factors. External factors that influence the organization and the internal factors that affect in the institution's progress and development. Implications for decision and understanding information system. We have already touched upon this environment, structure, culture, and the politics, the general atmosphere. Uh, if, the if the environment of the institution is something facilitating learning, then learning automatically takes place. Now we come to the how using technology in the case study of Deloitte, I have seen how using technology, this Deloitte company was able to progress in leaps and bounds. And in this, just like any other organizations, Deloitte company has realized, they have realized the power of sharing ideas and knowledge. And they initiated uh, a certain tie up with uh, various uh, social networking systems, site like Yama. Uh, to create an internal social network where employees can be their creative self and propagate ideas worth spreading. It serves as an uh, open platform for employees across the globe to interact, take help from each other, and make friends and share ideas. And in this, uh, the organization intelligence, the idea management, and how they share even screening employees, uh, how they use the social network. Uh, for example, Facebook, 
uh, all these various network, uh, network they use for screening employees. Uh, that gives them creativity and the ability to manage their own uh, um, organizations and updating their work culture. Now, as part of the studies, the elements of perseverance of Walmart. Now, I have creatively uh, put in six T's. Now, you see, the use of information technology has been an essential part of Walmart's growth. A decade ago, Walmart trailed Kmart, which could negotiate lower wholesale prices due to its size. They adopted a strategy in their troubled testing time. It was to acknowledge the truth that harnessing information technology was going to be their treasure. To enhance the sale, the faith and trust the company reposited in the team, as well as information technology, enabled them to catch up with a unique system of sale. And that was their success. Uh, to wind up, I would like to uh, thank the organizations for uh, giving me this opportunity to present my views on this organization learning. I'm aware time is short, but at the same time, I am indeed, indeed grateful to God for this opportunity to learn from each other and to be associated with such a very big organization and to take back uh, inspiration from such a uh, high-tech uh, developed uh, country as a UAE, particularly Abu Dhabi. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you. Okay, those were three very interesting uh, talks we heard, and the panel uh, discussion will commence now. So I leave the floor open for questions. Yes, please. Safat. Can you just state who is the question for? Either yeah, Professor Mary Elliott or uh, uh, Professor Marion? Of course, no problem. This is uh, Dr. Safwat from uh, Emirates College of Technology and Assistant Professor of Electronic Business. Uh, actually, I have lots of questions going in my mind for uh, Mr. Macy. Uh, I'll try within two. While we are trying to measure the return on learning, we should come out with specific tools on which we can depend in order to evaluate whether we are doing the learning in the way we want it to or not. Now, now how can we avoid falling into the ambush of having too much data to process while we're doing this? Okay, okay. Am I on that? Okay, perfect. Um, I think there are two sides of this. Um, the first element is I am obsessive about wanting an enormous amount of data. I, I want the data. But I know that I can't analyze or utilize everything that I have. But I want to take from a, a learning point of view a, a, a holistic view of getting at, at data. And then I need to bring an analytical perspective of what I do. Uh, give me, give me, let me give you an example. Yahoo, uh, under their CEO, Marissa, has tried to come up with what she calls some action data. She's interested, for instance, in what are the five or eight things people want to do every day around information. And so she gets a tremendous amount of data, and then they, they, they analyze it and chop it down to try to get into an action framework. The other piece of it is who is the client for the data? Because there really are, from our point of view, three clients. One client is the teacher. And in some cases, it could be the professor. In some cases, it could be the, devel the developer of content. The second is the individual. Because we actually think that the smart learner wants a tremendous amount of information about themselves and about learning. And then the third is the organization. Because in the workplace, what I want to know is how did that learning impact performance, retention? You, you talked before about things like courage. So what we'll find is we may have a wonderful 
effective learning program, but all it really succeeds in getting somebody to leave the organization because they, they, they can't practice it back there. So I, I, I think we are at that interesting moment where we're going to get much, much more data than we can analyze. But then we need to get an analytical framework, one that helps the teacher or the designer, one that helps the learner, and one that helps the, the, the organization to go through it. I would also argue we're at the very beginning of big data, the very beginning. And so we need to be learners about that process. And every now and then I find interesting data that I never would have thought of as having an impact, but it comes, it comes to me just by almost being an anthropologist of, of looking at, at that data. Okay, take the, another question, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, yeah. Sammy? No. No? Okay. Because I tried it before, give me a green light. Uh, thank you for all uh, speakers. Uh, it, it's a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity to have you and thank the organizers to uh, uh, collect all of these uh, uh, talent people in this room. Uh, my name is Dr. Abdelkim Darwish. I work in, in Sharjah Police Strategic Management uh, uh, Unit and uh, Performance Development. I have uh, uh, more a Socratic uh, uh, approach question, not uh, uh, sharing knowledge with uh, 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 our speakers. I think in, in building capacities of leaders who are missing uh, in some times the core of business system thinking. Because when they refer, as Mary, uh, Professor Mary told us, to the human resources, they look at, at the part of the picture, not the whole picture. And this is the easy way. Everybody wants the easy and to, to come out easily to results. So the difficult thing, it is how to connect the dots, everything, uh, 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 incentives, uh, uh, learning, outcomes, uh, and performance management and results and customer satisfaction and all. This is one, one aspect. Yeah, can, can we just have the question because there are others. Can we just, uh, what is the question? I said that I, I, I will comment as to, okay. to, to have share, sharing experience with uh, the speakers and all of us to, to share. Okay. And uh, the, uh, Mr. Messi uh, uh, said very important things about personalization. Interactivity is very important. And the train of trainers, uh, many of materials missing how to interact, how to develop trainers to interact. Because sometimes uh, analyzing data is not in office, in the right place directly. So it's very important to build the capacity for train trainers to sense this information inside and to personalize everything as, as stories. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And anybody has a quick response? Uh, uh, pa uh, audience, please, uh, in the interest of time, the speakers will be available during the lunch break. You can take up your discussions. But if you have a question, just please ask the question so that we can take benefit of their time here. Uh, question, please. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Professor Mary, uh, you talked about leaders of character. And Professor Marion, you talked about becoming someone in the world. Um, and my question is, can we talk about organizational learning in isolation? Because I, what I'm seeing is we're battling against educational systems that want to measure, that want to assess, that want to pass exams. So we're not producing those people of character. Yes, Professor Mary. Uh, that's the discovery I wish I'd made 25 years ago when I started this. And uh, I, I cannot underscore the, um, it's like a wildfire that's catching this piece on character and competence, because it's not just, uh, so we wrote, a we wrote an article that just won another 
award of the Outstanding Article of the Year in Academy of Management, Learning and Education on developing leader character. And again, it speaks to the fact that it's changing the conversation. But it's not just in business schools and it's not just in organizations. So now I've got educational um, elementary high schools coming to us because we've got an educational system that's built on knowledge, largely. Learn more math, learn more you know, English, more science, very competency-based. But we forgot about the fact that who is this person who is developing and uh, absorbing that competency? And when I think about organizational learning, swimming with crocodiles, is that, well, what happens when you don't have the courage to be able to stand up? Well, where does courage come from? How do we develop courage? Where does drive come from? How do people understand excellence? And where will that occur? And if we don't learn this in school, my view is that organizations now have become the place where we're starting to educate people really beyond simply doing business or the organization. But I'll say to my students and leaders that I work with is that you know, organizations are the instrument for societal change in modern day civilization. And you as leaders are there to not only lead the organization to make a positive difference in the world, but that through that work you will also help to develop the individuals. You will become educators. And that, that's just a whole nother level that we just haven't even exercised yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, just somebody. Okay, the lady at the back, please. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. No, it's yes, you. Uh, no, just behind you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the keynote speakers. Thanks very much. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Mary, maybe because I'm teaching now knowledge management. And in literature and in the course, we differentiate between learning organization and organiza organization learning. And um, actually, I would like to just discover, does, does le leaders of characteristics really apply? Can, can, we apply the, can we apply leader of, of characteristics on organization learning and learning organization as well? What do you think? And if I, may, if I may just ask Dr. Sidwin, uh, will the presentation be online, available online? Yes, the, presents, uh, it's the presentations will be online after the conference. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, as you probably know, the big distinction between organizational learning and the learning organization has largely been around OL has been more about descriptive. How is it that organizations learn? And that LO, learning organizations, is how could they learn? And there, there's a, actually a big gap between those two. But if I take your question uh, and I understand it well, I think the understanding, or for leaders, is that you need to understand how organizations do learn from a descriptive standpoint to also understand how they could learn. So for example, the piece that I showed about intuiting, interpreting, integrating, and institutionalizing, and you know, the uh, gentleman that spoke to us about systems thinking, the, the requirement for systems thinking or understanding how the complexity of a system of organizational learning relates means you need to a paradigm about how that occurs. And so understanding the messiness and the challenges of organizational learning, I believe, help the leader in terms of uh, leading a learning organization. I hope I've addressed your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman in front, please. Yeah. Uh, Professor Sid Ahmed Ben Rawan, University of Minnesota. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you finally. Elliot, I have been a fan of you since 1998. And it's ironic that I meet you in Abu Dhabi, not in the US. In 1998, we did not have the word of fan, so I was just on the database of the listserv of your email, which I still get today. Very simple question. When we talk about personalization, we have to solve the issue of tension that exists between specialization and the structure. So I wonder about your reaction when you talk to CEOs and CFOs and managers who have actually to look at certain 
short-term gains and a certain pressure or certain market performance? And what do they tell you in terms of introducing this personalization in their own organization? I have been lucky enough to be in a university where I have a lot of freedom to innovate in terms of how I teach. But I know that a lot of uh, colleagues get into trouble when they introduce new right. uh, methods and new ways of teaching. Thank you. Three quick points. Uh, number one is there is more of a desire to try to reduce to a very specific strategic level what is the competency or what is the, even what's the leadership set that this person needs in this situation. Um, because the more generalized it is, the less the learner tracks that. Now there's an overlay which is becoming an intriguing one, which is at the knowledge level, how much do we want the learner to know and how much do we want them to look up? Uh, it is that concept of applying performance support technology that says, so I have a very good friend, my wife and I have a friend in, uh, who lives seven miles from us. We don't know how to drive to their house because the GPS always takes us there. But we are having to ask an interesting question when it comes to learning. How much does the person need to know at a memorization level versus at an access level? And then you get to the third piece, and it sort of goes to the question that you dealt with, which is how do we get the learner started? There's a lot of finishing that we talk about in learning, and I don't believe in finishing. You know, I actually think the worst day of a student is when they graduate and we tell them they're done. <laughs> because in many ways, they're just getting started. And so we also want to leave our learners as learners. You know, in other words, that they, they go through a process and now they know what they are about to learn. Uh, we just did a meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. with the White House for, we took chief learning officers from very large corporations, including Walmart, were there. And the Secretary of Education and somebody from the White House said, what's missing in our workforce? And they said, it's not skills. We know how to train for skills. What's missing is the emotional intelligence to figure out, A, when to use the skills, or B, how to do business. He said, so we hire people for skills, we fire them for lack of emotional intelligence, which often means that the skills are taught without a larger context in that. And I think that's a, a powerful, and I will tell you, the Secretary of Education looked at us and he was a little rattled by that answer, but every one of the corporations agreed that this emotional intelligence is a key element. And, and that's why you can't just have the individual learning. You've got to put it into a cultural and job and job context as well. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah, the gentleman. Uh, my question is for Mr. Elliott. With all of these advances in technology, the open access, the MOOCs, and the nice watch that you showed us earlier, how all of this will lead for individual personal isolation and how all of this will feed to the big brother mentality and your thoughts on this. Thank you. Good question. Let me start. Yeah, I don't know the technology of turning my phone on. And so there we go. Let me start, but I would love to hear the, my colleagues' perspectives as well on that. Um, I make the distinction when we teach at Wharton, we talk about technology and affordances. A technology is something that's interesting and cool. Okay, so the phone came out and it was interesting, but it, it took us six to seven years before we figured out how to do much. And literally this morning I had a conversation with somebody here who said, well, most people use it still to take a photo. They, they don't necessarily do more. So we look at technology and affordance. Affordance is how can that technology help the individual and how can that technology help the, um, the organization or another element? I think we're going to be really challenged, okay? We had a conversation with two young teenagers from Dubai uh, the other night, and we asked them, if you got your watch, should it provide you data with are you eating well and are you healthy? And they said, okay, that'd be interesting. 
Well, should that be shared with your government or your doctor or your insurance or your parents? And suddenly they went, stop. <laughs> and I think these are really interesting conversations. And that's why the technology is there. We don't have a moral or a, a pragmatic set of affordances for that. And I think we as learning professionals have to become experimenters. And we have to figure out when does it work and when does it not work and how do we modify that. And big data is exciting and scary, enabling and disempowering. It is all of those elements. But at the end of the day, bluntly, I want educators or people in the learning field to understand big data so it's not m merely made as a business decision at another level. But I, I would be curious for both of my colleagues kind of how you see technology fitting into the, this, this larger picture of, of learning. Uh, when I look at the technology, am I audible? Yes. Uh, okay, when I look at technology, I see the modern generation, they are well equipped with handling different technologies. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to performing as an individual, as a human being, they fail there. Their relationship with which uh, um, ability to interrelate with others, that is not fine. When it comes to cooperating with the team members, they, they back out. So this kind of culture is creeping in with the advanced technology. People are forgetting. I have been uh, in the field of uh, teacher education, uh, training teachers over 18 years. And over the years, my experience has been, they just want a degree, a professional degree, which will make them an educator, but not beyond. What they deliver may not be quality. So such a stagnation has taken place uh, when they concentrate more on, uh, this is a negative aspect of information technology I'm saying. That is why in my presentation I pointed out, filtering the knowledge, aiding technology, using common sense, what helps me, what doesn't help me is absolutely essential. We are living in a society in the world where so much of erosion of values. Human beings are not ready to recognize another human being. So that character, competence, commitment, all that should develop along with the use of technology. Yeah. Then they become a person of importance, a person of relevance in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marion. Uh, I just got a quick question for Professor Mary. Uh, habits become character and normally leaders are, you know, have gone through 20, 30 years in a corporation. Uh, so is it possible to mold the character of a leader once, uh, you know, they are, they are mature and, you know, how can that be done? That's a great question. Um, it, thankfully, we've had about five years working with leaders that we've been able to establish that you can develop character. And I'll, I'll leave you with an image that, uh, that may help. Picture yourself uh, writing your signature. Maybe you're right-handed. You sign your name. Then you move your pen or pencil to the other hand, and you sign your name. It's different, and it's difficult. When it comes to character, it's the same way. We can't just assume that people have depth of integrity or depth of courage or depth of humanity, depth of accountability. Those are things that we need to learn. And through the uh, leadership development practices that we've been able to work with, having a diagnostic where they can assess what these deficiencies are and then work to develop them, it's nothing short of transformational watching uh, leaders and uh, it feels like they've opened a door uh, that they've never seen before in a quality of their person that affects not only their leadership in organization but many will also say affects their personal lives as well. Thanks Mary. One more question from the audience. Yes, Zayad? Yes. Uh, I don't have a microphone but I think I, I have a very loud voice. Yes. <laughs> Uh, my name is Dr. Ziad Kahlut. I'm uh, the Equality and Research 
Eliza, followed to by Yellow Patisa's program. My question is from Elia uh, Tassi. You mentioned that uh, personalized uh, training or personalized learning can be also involved for college levels. Uh, from quality point of view, quality and excellence is meeting customer ex expectations. And when we talk about education, there is a dilemma of identifying who are the customers. If I follow the personalized learning in college and I ask the students, how would your learning would you like it to be? They would like a lot of breaks and a lot of trips and a lot of fun. <laughs> and how can I balance between personalized learning in education in the college level and even in the corporate level? Mm -hmm. If I ask them to read what you would like to learn, yeah. how can I balance between the stakeholders' different expectations? Uh, it's a great, it's a great, and I think a perfect question. It, it is uh, personalized learning doesn't mean freedom. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean I'm free to define that. So my doctor. I want my doctor to be enormously skilled in a very difficult to attain set of competencies in that process. If it comes about that they learn best by instead of going to a lecture to watch a video, and we know in a global sense sometimes people where English might not be their primary language might want to watch that video multiple times, I have no problem. I'm not going to lower their assessment. <laughs> in fact, if anything, I want to make their assessment more difficult. And I want to make their assessment more specific. And I want to find this balance between what they are wanting to achieve for their career, what they're wanting to achieve for your degree. Um, I, I have a fantasy, we're not there yet, of a curriculum of one which means we literally give that learner almost every week a new curriculum based on their, their targets, their outcomes, what they, what they learned well in, what they learned poorly in, and even requiring them not only to learn but to teach somebody else in that, in that process. It's not about giving them the freedom to shape their own degree. It's about maximizing their time on task and on competency and using some data along the way. And bluntly, we have to give our teachers the freedom to be learners. It's very difficult to ask a teacher who's taught in one way to teach another way if she or he has never learned that way. We always do to our comfort zone. But I believe that this is an, an amazing moment of experiment. I close with uh, um, Richard Riley was the Secretary of Education in the United States and I had the honor of serving on a foundation board with him. He said our biggest problem at colleges is that four to six years after they graduate much of what they've learned is going to need to be refreshed, changed, or updated. How do we now put them in a college learning mode that creates the learning organization of one? <laughs> which means I graduate ready to continue to learn, to continue to... And these are great, great, great questions. And I think it's going to take traditional organizations doing it. And I'm very excited about new models, whether it be TED or uh, Khan Academy or competency-based models being part of that, that mixture in that process. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I may just uh, quickly summarize my learnings from this session from Elliot Massey. What I don't know already that I need to know now, uh, I think that was something a big takeaway for me and how to personalization of learning or how we are moving towards personalization of learning. From Professor Mary, the importance of leadership and the leadership uh, leadership's character in fostering organization learning. But one thing which I learned uh, 
today is that about training for the competition. When you're focused only on individual learnings where most of our organizations are and which are not embedded within the organization, uh, you're training for the competition. Uh, from Professor Merriam, uh, IT, how it can be used as an enabler rather than, as an, rather than an isolator. So I thank our panelists. Please give them a big hand. For for the discussion and for the excellent talks. And thank you all for participating in this discussion. OK, we'll have a lunch break. And uh, we will be back uh, at uh, one hour, approximately. Thank you very much.